excited about the Christmas uh, season. We are having, and I want you to put on your calendar, we will be having, that was a Chicago calendar, we will be having a Christmas Eve service right here. What time? Yell it out, Pastor Roger. What Six time is the Christmas Eve service? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. And so you can bring your kids. We'll have some portion of the service for them. You can drag in your out-of-town relatives. It may be the hour that you can keep them quiet and bring them everybody that you bring your friends. It'll be a great time here. I'm also excited and anticipating what God is going to do this next week through our Thrive Christmas offering. And I'm very thankful for what God is doing through your weekly tithes and offerings to the Lord. We partner with local ministries like CareNet Pregnancy Center. And this last week I had an opportunity to see right up face to face, up close, what God is doing through that ministry. I was invited to conduct a service and preach for a post-abortion a memorial service, and here these ladies have gone through a 10-week Bible study uh, centering in on the grace and forgiveness of God, and then during the service, they're naming their unborn babies, and they're memorializing them, and I'm telling you, it was uh, an emotional time filled with God's grace, and it's just awesome to be a part of what God is doing, and we're also... In this church, as you know, one out of ten dollars that you give in the offering go towards what we call the points of passion. And not only do we partner with local ministries, but we partner with the Association of Related Churches. And two percent of that ten percent, ten percent of our points of passion go towards uh, these couples that are planting churches. Last year, believe it or not, you were about one hundred churches planted through the Association of Related Churches we call the ARC that helped us plant, as well as we're partnering with monthly contributions to missionaries and projects all over the world, places like Russia, Cuba, Malaysia, Israel, Bangladesh, and also I'd like to say hi to Mike Consolo who said he would be watching from Ghana, Africa. It's warm there, so he's sitting back on Easy Street there. We want to say hi to him, and we want him to come home soon, right, LaDonna? Now, here in Haymarket, we are, as Pastor Mark mentioned, moving towards two services Easter time, and we have some financial hurdles to overcome in uh, being able to do that. And so we're challenging the church that you would do your best and give your best offering for this Thrive Christmas offering, and that you would ask the Lord how you're to enter into worship in this manner, and I want to thank you in advance. That's happening next week for all of you that will be here. All right. The wimps out there, too. You, you need to get double what the Lord tells you. <laughs> now, this is week one of our series we're calling Dreaming of a White Christmas, and wouldn't you say this morning that there's nothing like the white snow that just covers the ground, and I mean, everything is calm, and everything is bright. In fact, that is what we are naming and entitling this message this morning. All is calm. All is bright. And we're going to learn how to forgive those who have hurt us. Now, we are approaching the Christmas season. In fact, it has come this morning. And those of you that have children, you know that kids absolutely love Christmas. And this past week, maybe a little over a week ago, yes, I found myself in a Christmas party. And there was the best Santa Claus I have ever seen in my life. It cost $250 to hire him and his wife, and it was well worth it. I mean, I wanted to believe in Santa Claus. I wanted to sit in his lap. I started thinking of the things I wanted him to bring me. And I'm telling you, these kids, their eyes were just as big as saucers as they were mesmerized with this Santa Claus. And Christmas time is a magical time of the year for children. I mean, they're going off to Grandma's house and they're unwrapping Christmas presents. And Christmas, for many, is a great time of the year. But how many of you know when we get older that many times we encounter hurts that come our way and we have to deal with them at this time of the year. And for some, Christmas goes from being this high time of the year to being this 
low time of the year, and it becomes very difficult. And I don't think that it's actually that we even have more to deal with at this time of the year, but I think that Christmas brings out those difficulties. It's almost as though we have this white snow that covers, like we see this morning, and those little bark, uh, those little dark blots out there in the snow uh, just stand out in our lives and the hopelessness that we have and the disappointments that don't match up with the holly and the jolly just seem to be seen. Now numerous studies show this at this season and here's your first fill in. Are you ready? This season it seems like a holiday mirror that we have this holiday cheer and it seems to amplify the hopelessness and the unresolved conflicts that we have. And also is this whole holiday sphere. That's your next villain, and I'm going to be a rhyming pastor right now. Holiday sphere is the stress and it is the exhaustion of the holiday. And all you have to do is introduce a divorce or two into the mix. And how many of you know that this brings up uh, logistical issues at this time of the year? You're worried about getting to that Christmas party and that Christmas party and you have 25 different places to go and someone, it seems, always gets shafted. Now, Trish and I have some couples in our extended family that have encountered divorce. And what we start hearing is things like, uh, you spent Christmas Eve with them last year. Now you need to be with us, and you had too much time with that person. And how many of you know that that kind of thing happens? And then you introduce into the mix someone that's new to the family, somebody that wants to be called mom, or somebody that wants to be called dad, and you're not even sure who this person is. And there gets to be some heartache and some bitterness that's in the mix. It's a mirror. It's the whole holiday sphere. And the next go in is holiday tier. And how many of you know that uh, when there's an unexpected death that comes at this time of the year, you need to pray for the Ludwigs right now. Uh, Jennifer's father passed away this last night. What timing that is where you look at your table and it's filled with all of your family one Christmas and then all of the subsequent Christmases afterwards, this season seems to bring to mind an empty chair of the person that you love. Then there's this, uh, what I would say, holiday near, the people that are near, and uh, what I would call it is, I would call it the cycle factor. And I think that is actually a biblical uh, a principle. I don't know where it is in the Bible, but I actually believe that somewhere it is there that in every family Satan has planted some psycho family member. I mean, they say the right, they say the wrong thing, they do the wrong thing. I mean, this person is radical, they're a lunatic. And how many of you, and, and I know I'm, I'm asking you to do this this morning, how many of you have in your mind a psycho, now put your hand up, you have a psycho relative. Okay, raise both hands if you have to. Keep them up. Okay, keep them up for just a minute. This is fun. Now look around the room. Okay? Keep your hands up. Look around the room. The people that have their hand down, you're the psycho one. Okay, all these years you thought you lived in a normal family, and all these years they were talking about you, and everybody that raised their hand said a hearty amen this morning. Now that's holiday news. Holiday year. Now, you thought that they were talking. You thought your family was normal. Now here, uh, we know that offenses seem to come to the forefront at this time of the year. And I would say this morning is that this is not God's dream for your life. Do you know that the devil came to kill, steal, and destroy? What did Jesus come to do? He came to give life and life more abundantly. And the problem is at this time of the year, Many people would agree with the sentiments of that scripture, but they're not living the reality of that in their life. And my question this, this morning for you is this. What if you could experience a white Christmas? I mean, what would it be like if 
everything was calm, if it was all merry and bright, what if you would be free from the prison of these wounds? Now, how many of you have been hooked on the game Angry Birds in the past? I know that I have. Okay? If you don't know what Angry Birds is, Angry Birds is this game where Angry Birds take out their revenge on pigs that have stolen their eggs. Now, interestingly enough, and ironically enough, they launch themselves into these buildings, and even though they kill these pigs, yes, you guessed it, they die themselves. Now, <laughs> the reason I say that is, uh, in this game, every time there's escalation, you're able to go to a new level. And what I would say this morning is that many people have bought into that same process, and we need to be set free from that. Now, it's been said that forgive, unforgiveness is like a man who would set himself on fire, hoping that the other person would die from smoke inhalation. I like that. <laughs> Isaiah 118, it says this, this is a theme verse for this morning, come, now let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Good verse for this morning. I'm a prophet. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. And then I'd like you on your notes to write in the margin, write the words, the word if. Because <laughs> the scripture says, if you will only obey me. So the question this morning is, what do you do? What do you do when you've been hurt or betrayed? Now this morning, we're going to make three biblical choices. And the reason why I call them choices is they're choices. And oftentimes, we want to go on our feelings. I know that that's the way that we're built. But we are going to make some choices this morning. I know that for me, uh, if somebody's messed me around, if they've uh, messed with my life, I don't wake up in the morning saying, oh, I feel like being a kind person. I feel like loving. What I feel like many times is saying I'm going to launch myself into some pigs. But this morning, we're not going to go on our feelings. We are going to look to the Word of God and make some choices based on the Word of God. Now we're going to make three biblical choices. Here's a fill-in for you. The first one that we're going to do when we've been hurt, and this is a fill-in for you, we're going to choose to pray. We're going to choose to pray. Now, the greatest example of this that I know of unquestionably is Jesus Christ himself. When you look to the Christmas story, when he was born in the manger, Herod the king wanted to seek him out. Why? To kill him. And then when he grew up, he goes back to his hometown. He's pushed to the edge of a cliff. Why? Because those people that he grew up with wanted to push him off that cliff and kill him over and over again. And over again in the scripture, you have people mistreating Jesus and betraying him. And then what does he do? He chooses 12 disciples that he says, you're going to be my best friends. I'm going to reveal the Father to you, and I'm going to train you to overcome. I'm going to train you to change the world. And what do we find? We find that one of those 12 closest friends, what does he do? He betrays him with a kiss. And then when we go to the crucifixion, only one of those friends showed up. When he was brought before Pilate, Pilate looks at Jesus and says, there's nothing that I can find wrong with this person. There's no sin in this person. Yet, what does he do? He takes the gutless avenue, and because of peer pressure of the crowd, and the crowd turns against him, he turns Jesus over to crucifixion. And then he's mocked by creation. And they put stakes through his hands, and they put a cruel thorn crown on his head, and they whip him, and they beat him to an inch of his life. And we, all of creation, turn their back on Jesus. And there you have his society, his friends, and all of us turning our back on him. And what does Jesus do? I'll tell you what he does. It's in the scripture. It's in your notes. It's Luke 23, 34. What does Jesus do? He prayed, Father, forgive them. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now when you're hurt, and 
even you don't feel like it, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to pray. What do you pray? I've got three things that you can pray. And here's a fill-in for you. The first thing is, we're going to pray that God would heal their hurt. We're going to pray that God will heal their hurt. You know that it's often said, it's almost pithy, but hurting people hurt people, and the chances are if someone is lashing out, they've been hurt themselves. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pray that God would heal them. Number two, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to pray that God would forgive them. For God to forgive them, that they would actually feel conviction, that they'd be drawn to the love of God just like you were, that they would realize that they're lost and that they would give their heart to Jesus, and that's what we're going to do. The third thing is even harder, and that's the next fill-in for you. It's a very difficult thing, but it's biblical. We're going to pray that God would bless them. <laughs> that is tough. We're going to pray that God would bless them. Now, here's what you need to realize. Is that when we do these things, when we actually obey and not follow our feelings and make the right choices, that our prayers may not change that other person that the circumstances may not change one iota, but I tell you what will change our hearts. Because we cannot pray prayers of blessing. We can't forgive and we can't obey the scripture without our hearts being transformed. Luke 6.28, Jesus said this, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who who mistreat you. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make the choice to pray. Second thing, even more difficult, what we're going to make the choice is we're going to make the choice to forgive. And now why is this important? It says in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. That's, a, that's good. But check this out. If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I mean, what a sobering verse. That if we forgive other men their sins, that God would forgive us. But if we don't forgive our brother, then we're out of luck. I mean, that is a sobering, sobering verse. And the reason is that uh, Christianity, uh, forgiveness is not an elective. I mean, the exams are, are very tough, and so we need to forgive. I know for myself, if someone does me wrong once, that's okay. But if somebody does me wrong again, I start to wise up, and it's easy to forgive the first time. But the second time you want to write them off, you want to disinvite them, you want to unfriend them on Facebook, that's the way I am. And Jesus probably knew this. He knew this was going to happen. And in Matthew 18, 21 and following, Jesus and Peter have this discussion among themselves. And Peter comes to Jesus and he says, how many times must I forgive a brother who sins against me? And you can almost hear the, like, I'm greater than thou, I'm pretty good, you know, kind of tone in Peter's voice when he says, should I forgive them seven times? The underlying thing is I could have said one time. I could have said maybe I could forgive two or three or four, but I said seven. And what does Jesus do? Jesus looks at Peter and says, you need to forgive seven times 70. And what Jesus was saying is you need to have unlimited grace. Why? Because I gave you unlimited grace. This is what I wrote in my sermon journal. In other words, and maybe you could write this down, give unlimited forgiveness just as God's forgiveness is unlimited to us. Now, honestly, there are not very many things that make me angry, but there are a few things that you could say to me, just a few, or do that, that make me go ballistic. And one of them is when I go to a restaurant and there's this big over, kind of overweight manager and he's sweating and it's a day like today, it's 35 degrees outside and it's, the air conditioning is on in the restaurant, all the women are wearing parkas and I say, hey, do you think maybe you can turn on the heat? My 
wife's cold? And he says, no. That drives me crazy. <laughs> okay, the second thing is, the second thing that absolutely makes me ballistic is when you do something against one of my friends. I mean, you can say something uh, bad to me. You can say a lot of things about me and it kind of goes off my back. But if you treat one of my friends wrong, then I go absolutely ballistic. Now, I've been this way all my life. When I was in high school, I had a friend named Tom Woolbright, who was my best friend. And he dated one of the girls in the youth group. She was a deacon's daughter. And she did the unpardonable sin. She two-timed my friend Tom Woolbright. And I took up his cause. And what did I do? I've always been good, and I have to watch this. I'm good at one-liners, and I'm good at cut-downs. And I began picking on her. She had kind of this nose. And, and I started putting her down. And, 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 and boy, was it awesome. And then one night, I went to read my scripture as a teenager. And God's conviction came into my life. I apologized to her. And later on, I found out that... Um, she ended up going to Bible college and marrying this guy, studying for the ministry, and this was not my best moment. Later on, I found out that she was in counseling. Why? Because her self-esteem was taking hits and all that she underwent as a teenager. Now, you might be listening to this message today, and also, God may be knocking on the door of your heart saying that there's some people that you should forgive. There in your notes, I wrote down, who is it that you need to forgive? Now, if it's your spouse, <laughs> if you had a little tip, um, you're driving too, too fast, it's, it's, it, it, you know, uh, it's like out here, if you had a little tip, um, if it's your spouse, don't write that down and elbow them, okay? But there may be someone that you need to forgive, and it's hard to do so, especially when they don't deserve it. Now, here's what I do. How do you forgive someone? Maybe this will help you as well. Uh, what I do is, and it's a filling, is I focus on how God has forgiven me. When I think of the stacks of indictments against me, the times that I've betrayed other people, the times that I've sinned, the times that I've done wrong things, and I've been that psycho relative, I look at all of these things, and when I do, I realize that, it, hey, it's a little easier to extend forgiveness to someone else. When I need it so badly. And here's what the Bible says in Colossians 3.13. We're taught to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive whatever you have against each other. And then it says this. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So how are we to forgive? We're to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. Now the sad thing is, we see it a lot in the church, is... Uh, we see unforgiveness in marriages. And I read about this story about a, a counselor that gave this couple this advice that they could work through their problems. And I don't, uh, I don't recommend this, but this is what they told them to do. They said, get two boxes, cut a slit in it. We'll call them fault boxes. And then during this next week, every time your spouse does something against you, I want you to write it down and they drive you crazy. I want you to write it down on a piece of paper. I want you to put it in the fault box. And at the end of the week, they took the fault boxes and the wife, very excitedly, took that box, it was overflowing, and gave it to her husband, and he started ripping these out, you know, like, put the toilet seat down. You didn't put it down, okay? Your underwear, you need to put it away. You didn't call me, you were late from work, and one after another of his faults, and he felt very humiliated. And then, it was her turn. And the box is overflowing, and she pulls out the first piece of paper, and she opens it, and you know what it said? I forgive you. She pulls out the next one. I forgive you. So on. I forgive you. I forgive you. Now listen, those who have, uh, this is a burden, and those who have tasted the blood of divorce, you know that the fastest and the greatest amount of hurt that can be introduced into someone that you love is for them to go through this. And I want the sound to be a place where people that have been crushed in relationships can come and 
find healing. But the question I often have is, for those of us that are Christians and have Christian marriages, sometimes we're just trying to get along to get along. We're, we're going through, we're going to have a cordial Christmas. I'm dreaming of a cordial Christmas. We're trying to just get along for the kids' sake. What would it be like if we actually obeyed the Word of God? What would happen? So you choose to pray. Look at, oh, this is number three. Choose to pray. Look at Romans 12, 19 through 21. That's your next fill-in. For those of you that are saying you didn't get the next fill-in. Choose to pray. Paul said to the Roman church, Romans 12, 19 through 21, he said, don't take revenge. He said, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Look at Luke 6, 27 and 28. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So what do you do? You bless, you pray, you forgive, and you bless. And how many of you know that this is a choice and not a feeling? Somebody say amen this morning. Now, inevitably, whenever we talk about subjects like this, I kind of get some kickback, and I've had people say this to me, that you don't understand, you're a preacher. It's kind of like you live in this preacher bubble and have this perfect family. I mean, I'm glad you have this image of me. I don't know how many of you do, but if you do, congratulations, you're stupid. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. That was a swear word in my family, but I'm telling you what. Listen, I live in the same sin-soaked world that you all live in. And I don't know that I've encountered uh, as deeply as each and every one of you, but I've encountered hardships and disappointments and betrayals in my life. And let me tell you this, I'll say it with a smile on my face, that uh, I'll give you a preacher's secret. Do you want a preacher's secret? This is just for those of you that uh, came through the snow. You cannot be, you don't know this because you're not a preacher, but you cannot be a preacher without being heard. Now, I've, oh, we got a few preachers this said amen. Okay, now listen. I do have friends that are preachers that do it because it's a vocation. That their gift set matches what they do as a preacher. I think that's kind of sad because I... I I'm not even sure my gift set matches <laughs> being a preacher. But I knew, I know this, that I am called. And that uh, the calling isn't even enough. Now that, that might sound uh, not very holy. But the calling isn't enough. That God also put a corresponding love for people in my heart. And that I probably wouldn't do it just because of the call. But he put this love in my heart for people. And what I've discovered is that wherever there is great love, there's a possibility and potential for great hurt. And my dad gave me this uh, gift of scripture when I entered the ministry. And I've been skipping here this morning through the notes. We'll get you out here. This is what's coming here. <laughs> but my dad uh, gave me this gift of scripture, and it really was it's greater than any gift that he's ever given me. And my dad gave us a brand new car for graduation and our, our, our wedding. This is great. It was a scripture verse at the time of my entering the ministry. And it came with, I've got a word from the Lord for you, son. And uh, if, if there's anything I can wish for you, it would be for you to have a dad that um, would have those kind of moments for you. But my prayer would be that you'd be the kind of dad or kind of mom that would have those moments with your kids. But he gave me this scripture, it's Ecclesiastes 10.9. It's a really odd scripture, so it did take his kind of, I have a word from the Lord, to have it make sense. It's this, it's in your notes. It says, whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. And then it says, whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Now, this is what he said to me. He said, remember Mr. Benson? <laughs> now, Mr. Benson had this shop next to my dad's warehouse, and I'd been over there, and I had watched Mr. Benson. What he did is he took these big marble rocks, and he took the 
chisel and he took the hammer and he made statues. He made all sorts of things, little, little peen garden boy statues and headstones and some things were very beautiful. And he said this, he said, remember um, how scarred his forehead was and his face? And I did. Because invariably when he was hammering and chiseling away at that marble, you know what would happen. Pieces of the, the rock would fly up and oftentimes injure him, hurt him. Sometimes he had stitches. And he had one of the most rough faces I've ever seen. And then this is what my dad said. I wrote it in my sermon journal. He said, if Mr. Benson remained true to the vision of his heart and kept pounding away despite the wounds and let the chips fly as they may, he knew in the end the result would be a beautiful marble statue. So whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Why? Because you need to, you need these stones to build a beautiful cathedral. You need to chip away at it if you're going to fashion something beautiful like a statue. And this is your takeaway this morning. And it's a fill-in for you. If we keep hammering away and work through our pain, then the dream God has placed in our heart will result in a beautiful creation. So here's, here's the end. Here's how we'll do it this morning. It is the question that I have for you as it, we deal with forgiveness and unforgiveness is, what if we hammered away at this thing? What if we met it face to face and we made the choices that God would have us make and that we pray, that we forgive, and that we bless. What would be on the other side of that? I believe on the other side of that, God would, because he has a dream for you. He has a, a white Christmas dream for you, that at the end of that would be something beautiful for you in your life. Bow your eyes, close your eyes this morning. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Tonight we got the short version of that message. Maybe I should do that every week. <laughs> but with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you cannot do the work of forgiveness without God's help in your life. Now let me say this. I'm going to say something strong and then we're going to pray. I would say this, that if you cannot forgive, there is a chance that you have not been forgiven yourself or you haven't realized the extent of the forgiveness that has been placed in your life. Because of forgiven, forgive. That's what forgiven people do. Forgiven people forgive. Jesus gives the capacity to forgive. And this is huge. It is life and death, I believe, for some people that are watching online, for some that are listening here this morning. And I want to pray for two groups of people this morning. Number one, I want to pray for the reason why you cannot forgive. Maybe it's that you've lost sight of God's forgiveness. Or maybe you've not been forgiven in the first place. And today, you want to get some things right with God. You want to get some things right with Him. So that everything's bright and clear. Now today, you may say, Barry, I... I I need to have that capacity for forgiveness. I, I need to experience the forgiveness of Christ in my life or I need to pick up the chisel and remember it again and hammer away. And I need to get some things right with God in my life. This morning with every head bowed and eyes closed, I'm not going to have you come forward. Or I'm not going to have you come front or stand up. But I'm simply going to ask you to pray where you are. And so for everyone listening this morning, today if you are watching online and with no one looking around, Barry, I, you're saying, Barry, I need to get some things right with God. I need to experience forgiveness. I need the capacity to forgive. I need forgiveness myself. I want to pray for you right where you're seated. I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand up right where you're at and you're saying, count me in, Pastor Barry. I need that in my life. If that's you, could you just lift up a hand right now? My hand's raised. I need that capacity to extend it to others my life. I want to pray for you right where you're at. You can put your 
hand up and then you can put it right back down. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray a prayer and make it your own. Say, God, forgive me. Say, I've wronged you, Lord. Today I receive what Jesus did on the cross and I'm free. I give you my life. I return it to you. Come live inside of me. Give me the ability to love. Give me the ability to forgive the way that you do. And say this to him. Say, I give you my life. I give you everything. Today, Lord, I pray for everyone that just prayed that prayer. I celebrate with them. Lord, I thank you for lives changed. And now, Lord, I pray that you would put the capacity to work beyond the hurt. So, Lord, that you could build a your beautiful image, what you have dreamed for each and every one.